and welcome to another program in the 2020 election spirit series sponsored by the baker institute i'm john williams a fellow at the institute's presidential elections program and today we're going to be joined by two and hopefully three of the brightest and best plugged in journalists in the state to explore the 2020 presidential election in texas and beyond hopefully abby livingston will be able to join us she's having some computer issues and it, at worst, she'll be able to join us via audio. She's the only journalist that I know of who's a seventh generation Texan, has appeared on the soap opera, The Bold and the Beautiful, and can slide as hard into second base as anyone as one of the best softball players in the Washington Press Corps. She joined the trip in 2014 as the first Washington Bureau Chief. And in that role, she covers members of the Texas Congressional Delegation and campaigns back in her home in her home state. Patrick Svitek is the primary political correspondent for the trip. He's logged more miles in the state on presidential campaign trails than Texas rancher Charles Goodnight did driving cattle to Texas. A 2014 graduate from Northwestern University's Medell School of Journalism, he previously worked for my old newspaper, the Houston Chronicle, and its Austin Bureau. Evan, Evan Smith is the CEO and co-founder of the Texas Tribune which has broken new ground in nonprofit journalism since opening over 11 years ago. A former editor of the Texas Monthly, Evan has a unique blend of the best attributes of Edward R. Murrow, Catherine Graham, and P.T. Barnum. If you're interested in Texas and, the, and politics in the straight state, the Tribune is the place to go because Evan quite simply knows how to get our attention and how to keep it. Today, our panelists will discuss what may be a landmark presidential election as Joe Biden hopes to become the first Democrat to win the Lone Star State since Jimmy Carter did that in 1976. That may or may not be simply wishful thinking by Democrats. The polling indicates that something is happening in this hard red state and it could affect us for decades to come. Abby, Patrick, Evan, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, John. It's so good to see you and to be with all of you. And I want to thank uh, everybody from the Dean on down at the Baker Institute for uh, having us today. We're very pleased to be joining you, Patrick. Hi. Hi. Happy to be uh, we're here. Gonna, we're going to have the conversation that we would be having in private anyway, but we're just going to do it for the benefit of people. Um, Abby, I know, is desperately trying to get on. And if she does get on, I know she'll speak up and she'll, she'll, uh, she'll join the conversation. But let me dive in while we have you now, Patrick, alone. Uh, and let me ask you to give an overview of the race at this point. We are seven days out. As John Williams correctly said, this is not a state uh, that we're used to uh, um, being competitive seven days out. In fact, I, I think just back my um, measly 30 years of paying attention to Texas politics and journalism, and I can't remember an election cycle in which I did not know with certainty what the headlines would be the day after the election seven days out. And this is one of those elections, uh, Patrick, where we really don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way I think about it constantly is you have four blockbuster, you know, big picture events to watch in Texas on, on November 3rd. And in any other election cycle in Texas, just one of these would be huge in terms of having this level of competition in a state like Texas. So you obviously have the presidential race where uh, Joe Biden is polling pretty close to Donald Trump in Texas, and in some polls is, is even ahead within the margin of error, but ahead. Um, and you're seeing the Biden campaign pay a little more attention to Texas in the home stretch here, adding to their, their TV reservations, um, and also sending his running mate Kamala Harris to the state on Friday. Um, yep. Looking farther down uh, the ballot on the statewide side, you have a U.S. Senate race where the Republican incumbent John Cornyn, uh, you know, has been ahead in polls by single digits, but we've seen some signs in the past couple of weeks that this may be a, a more competitive and hotly contested home stretch. You have the Democratic nominee, MJ Hager, uh, really outpacing Cornyn in fundraising since July um, in a very serious way. And you've had some Democratic outside groups come in at the last minute to try to help push her over the finish line. Cornyn has been on the attack against Hager um, for the past uh, few weeks now on TV in, in a really aggressive way. So again, even if he has a polling lead in this race, we've seen some signs that it's ending on a pretty competitive note. And then looking uh, below those statewide races, uh, you have a very wide congressional battlefield in Texas. Yep. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee is targeting 10 Republican held seats here. The National Republican uh, Congressional Committee is trying to flip back the two seats they lost 
in 2018 in Dallas and Houston. So that's a, a 12 seat congressional battlefield in Texas. Unlike yep. anything we've seen before. And then the fourth big blockbuster event is the fight for the state house majority where Democrats are currently nine yep. seats away from the majority after picking up 12 in 2018. So again, I think about it, those four big blockbuster events in any previous cycle in Texas, just having you know, one, one of, of those, those right. not an earthquake. Yeah. Uh, I see that Abby's joined us. Hi, Abby. Good Hi. to see you. Um, we, Patrick and I were just talking about what an extraordinary election cycle this is in terms of the level of competition that none of us is used to seeing competitive elections to the degree that they are this year. For all of us in journalism, right, this is like the greatest thing that happened. I wake up every day in this cycle thinking this is the Super Bowl, the Olympics, and my bar mitzvah all at once, right? It's the greatest thing that ever happened. You feel that way too? Absolutely. I mean, one of the few hesitations I had in taking this job when you were hiring me six years ago was that there wasn't much going on politically in campaigns. Ha, and come on. It was going to be great. We knew it. Okay, well, there was one competitive yeah. congressional district. And, uh, yeah. you know, now it's I can't even I, I'm almost paralyzed in reporting because there's just so much going on to keep track of. And yeah. so yeah. it's it's quite extraordinary. And I think also like I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm kind of in the national political chatter. And Texas right. is the center of the world. Everyone is obsessed with it at the congressional level, um, at the Senate level, and now at the presidential. It's taken a little while for the statewides to come online, but this is this is a national fascination. So so the, the inside out piece, which Patrick so ably looks after for us, we know that inside Texas, everybody is talking about Texas, but you're confirming my sense, which is that outside Texas, the outside in view there is just as much interest in what's going on here. Absolutely. I mean, you look back at, um, you know, at the, the very few things I can do socially um, amid the pandemic, I will get asked about Texas. And the only time I can yeah. compare that to is like November of 2018, right after the Beto O'Rourke um, near when it was just what is going on here. And it's also just somewhat foreign territory for national reporters. It's, a, it's an unknown like this has not been a place people have covered in yeah. a generation. So you've got a generation of reporters just trying to figure things out and operatives. Yeah. Um, Patrick, I noticed today that Mark Murray, the political director or a, a, a political director at NBC News, uh, noted that NBC has now moved Texas from lean Republican to toss up. Again, let me note for the people who are not looking at the calendar, we're seven days from the election and they've moved the state now from lean Republican to toss up. I know he's a graduate of the University of Texas, but still that's pretty significant, is it not? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty. It's a pretty ambitious move, I would say, even, even though there is a lot of reason for democratic optimism, a pretty yeah. ambitious move to see a national forecaster put it in that category. But as we talked about earlier, I mean, the polling at the presidential level continues to be pretty competitive looking, um, you know, and you have the Biden campaign sending Kamala Harris here on Friday. The Biden campaign by you know, no means has gone all in on Texas at the end here, but they're certainly sending some signals that they view right. this as a late opportunity. Well, and to the point about the polls, Patrick, so we've had three polls come out over the last 48 hours with different um, uh, uh, outcomes or different uh, findings, right? The Dallas Morning News, uh, University of Texas Tyler poll showed Biden up by three. Then the University of Houston Hobby School poll showed Biden up by Five, and then the New York Times Siena College poll showed Biden up by four. So you have a range of Biden plus three to Trump plus five, which, okay, fine. But, you know, the closest presidential election of the modern era was when Bob Dole beat Bill Clinton for, by five points in 1996. Even if you take the over in terms of the Trump lead in those polls, it is still setting up to be one of the closest races in the modern era. Absolutely. I mean, all these polls, they've certainly varied, especially in the past few days. But one thing that remains true is that every single one of these margins is closer than Trump's margin in 2016 in Texas, which was yep. nine points. And at the time was the closest margin for Republican nominee in Texas in, in two decades. So, you know, we're closing in on a baseline or we're, we're dealing with a baseline that was already historically small, yeah. at least in, in modern time. And so, you know, again, you can pick your poll any day of the week um, to fit your narrative, but you can't dispute that every single one of these polls is producing a margin that is smaller than Trump's margin in, in Texas in 2016. Right. And Abby, to, to, to level set, Patrick is correct. Uh, Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton in Texas by nine points in uh, 2016. Mitt Romney won by 16. John McCain won by almost 12. Even nine points was a step back from where Republicans had historically been. And it wasn't so much that Secretary Clinton overperformed, it was that the president, then candidate Donald Trump, underperformed. So we already had the nine-point margin. Add to that the closeness of the Senate race in 2018, 
I mean, really, maybe we shouldn't be all, all that surprised to see these polls be this close. On top, yes. And I, I believe in polls. I believe in internal polls. I mean, obviously, they're of yeah. different quality. But my question is, how do the pollsters know who's turning out? I mean, well, we, that is a great question. Right. And I, I don't think we know. And I think there is enthusiasm on the, the left and the right in Texas. And I think we're seeing a geographic battle of rural versus city slash suburban. And so, I, you know, I'm I think the polls are a guide, but I think you have to be educated in how you look at polls. It's a snapshot in time. They've been yeah. consistent, but they're not. I, I mean, I, I I get frustrated after an election when someone says, oh, the polls are wrong. And it's 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 a it's part science, part art. And they're not these, you know, dead set metrics, if that makes sense. Well, and in fact, one of the things that came out about uh, the polls over the last couple of days uh, was you know, the late polls in the Senate race in 2018 still showed Ted Cruz ahead by a margin greater than what his ultimate margin was on Election Day. So even if you look at, you know, what are considered to be the most reliable polls, they're only, as you point out, going to be a snapshot of that moment in time. In fact, they're looking back over their shoulder because invariably they were in the field a couple of days before the results come out. And the cliche is true. The only poll that matters ends up being the one on Election Day, Right. Absolutely. I mean, I think back to the 2008 Democratic primary. Barack Obama comes out of Iowa and everyone in the national media, including myself, thought Hillary Clinton was going to lose New Hampshire. Right. And right. every poll in New Hampshire said that. But the, the public in New Hampshire changed over the course of seven days. And so yep. things move. It's not that things are wrong. It's just the public can change its mind. Yeah, the, yeah. the Senate race in 2018, I think, was a great example of that. I know that especially in the final a few weeks of that race, it was a pretty fast changing environment. A few weeks before that, you had the Kavanaugh hearings. The Cruz campaign right. came out of that thinking that they that that had energized their voters and helped them build a, you know, mid to high single digit lead in the race. And I think they said on the record at the time, that's what their internal polling was showing. Then early voting started. Beto work, you know, I mean, he was already campaigning very hard, but really increased, uh, you know, his in-person campaigning, holding all these early voting site rallies. Um, and we all know how, how that race ended with him uh, ending up yeah. 2.6 points behind uh, Cruz. So things uh, I know the potential for in-person campaigning in this stretch is obviously limited, but things can change quickly. And as Abby said, you know, polls can just be a snapshot in time or should be viewed as a snapshot in time. So, uh, Patrick, Abby teed up turnout, which I think is the most important element of all this. I've been thinking for some time when people say, how's the election going to turn out? Let me go in my time machine ahead to the day after the election and figure out what the turnout was. And that will be, allow me to say what I think the result might be, because turnout really does matter. You know, we had 9 million people, almost 9 million turnout to vote in 2016. We had almost 8 million turnout to vote in 2012. We are sitting here today through the end of yesterday at 7.8 million people. 87% of the 2016 turnout has already turned out just in the early vote period with four full days of early vote left plus actual election day. So what's the ultimate turnout number, Patrick, going to be? It could be 11 million. It could be 12 million, right? I think it's safe to say that it's it's going to exceed 12 million, which I think is just uncharted territory for the state in terms of being able to... I mean, think about this. If it's, if it's 12 million, it is fully one third greater than the largest ever turnout in the history of Texas. Right. And we should point out, I mean, right now we're with the, you know, seven point whatever million people who already voted early in Texas. I mean, that's already over 40 percent tur turnout rate of the registered voters in Texas. I mean, this right. is, I think, really um, going to end up over 12 million people uh, voting. It's going to be a very high turnout rate. And I think when you see an increase like that, uh, all bets are off. And, um, right. you know, it's going to be uncharted territory. P Patrick, the conventional wisdom on turnout at that size, and Abby, I want your read on this as well, is that a high turnout election is bad for the party in power. Not for bad for Republicans, but Republicans happen to be the party in power now because high turnout elections are motivated by people who are pissed off, not people who are happy. Angry people vote. Happy people don't necessarily vote, but angry people do vote. So should we perceive a, a turnout of 12 million or more as necessarily bad for Republicans in this case? Patrick first and then Abby. <laughs> I never wanted to touch that. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, obviously right now you can look at polling in any state nationally. 
there is it tends to be more enthusiasm on the Democratic side. I would assume that that uh, applies here in Texas. I don't know what the latest poll that tackled that question is. Um, but at the same time, you know, Republicans have also focused over the past two years to put a, at least in Texas have put a renewed focus on voter registration, have put a renewed focus on the kind of nuts and bolts party functions to bring more people into the party and to turn them out. And so, yep. you know, you certainly talk to some Republican operatives, uh, you know, publicly and privately. And, and, you know, I don't think that they're necessarily, um, you know, super concerned that super high turnout is going to dramatically favor Democrats. I think that they would sit, they would concede that sure it favors Democrats, but they have some some cause for optimism on their side, given the party building they've done over the past uh, two years and, and also just enthusiasm um, for their candidates in general. I mean, obviously, there's enthusiasm for President Trump, um, but they also have some down ballot candidates who I think are generating real enthusiasm. And I know Abby wrote a story about that kind of up ballot effect uh, that, that could be happening here. And I'm sure we'll, we'll yeah. get to that later. A Abby, is your sense that high turnout is necessarily better for one party or another? I mean, my instinct is it's probably better for Democrats, but I don't really like reading things like that anymore, given all the topsy-turvy nature of politics in the last five years. Yep. I would argue both sides are angry. I mean, I, I think the Trump folks can be very angry at the same time, even as the out-of-power Democrats are angry. And I just think Trump is a unique figure that energizes both ways in an ahistorical way. Yeah. Abby, what do you make of the reporting that there are a very high percentage of people who have no general election voting history who have voted early so far? You know, it's one thing to be able to say, as as our mutual um, uh, kind of work friend, Derek Ryan, who is the Republican oh. strategist, consultant, uh, did yesterday reported in his daily email about the vote that 86 percent or so of the so-called four D's have voted so far. These are people who voted in the last four Democratic primaries or 81 percent of the four R's. People who voted in the last four Republican primaries have voted. But there's some number of people who have early voted who have no voting history. Now, that may be because of the growth of the state's population, people migrating into Texas from other places or whatever. But what does that tell you about uh, how, how we look at these numbers? I still think it comes back to Trump. I think he brings people to the party I, uh, that yeah. have never cared before about politics. At the same time, I think it probably indicates younger people are voting, possibly Latinos. Right. Um, yeah. Californians, I keep hearing about Californians who've moved to Texas. And so I, I just, uh, probably my gut is it helps Democrats, but I, I am yeah. just very cautious in making assumptions like that. You know, Patrick, the funny thing about the 2018 Senate race, to use that again as the benchmark here, is that after all of the fuss and tumult about what happened, we discovered after the fact, we think at least, that the native Texans voted for O'Rourke over Cruz, but it was the people not from Texas who voted for Cruz over O'Rourke, right? So the idea that somehow people coming from the outside might somehow favor a Democrat and, and dilute this Republican state's vote, at least in the case of the Senate race, maybe turned out not to be true. Right. And that, you know, that uh, ironically sometimes goes against the Republican rhetoric we hear on on the, you know, political makeup of voters who are migrating into the state, at least in right. that, it appeared that they, they favored the Republican. Yeah, don't, don't California, my Texas right. becomes go right ahead. Do California, my Texas, right. Right, if it ultimately results in that. Um, uh, uh, Patrick, Abby referenced rural voters and, and urban voters. Obviously, we have a state that is rapidly urbanizing. Some somewhere in the vicinity of 88 or 89 percent of the state of Texas lives east of Interstate Highway 35 um, of the growth in population between now and 2050, as the demographers predicted, the vast majority, 90 plus percent is going to occur in the metropolitan counties of the state. Um, and yet rural Texas saved Ted Cruz last time. Rural Texas saved Ken Paxton last time. Rural Texas may have saved Dan Patrick last time by being reliably out there and voting. So is the geography of the vote this time going to look like it did last time? The city is blue or blues, rural is red or reds, and the purpling suburbs are the ball game. Yeah, I think so. And I think for Republicans statewide, the, you know, uh, the rural parts of the state will be the, the firewall, or at least they're hoping that, that that holds up. I mean, they they acknowledge that the you know cities are getting bluer, the suburbs are getting more competitive, and in some cases, becoming lean Democratic overall. Um, you know, if you look at some of the margins of some of these suburban counties increasingly, uh, but that the rural, you know, there's one Republican, you know, operative I talked to a while ago, who, you know, said 
I, I'm really thankful that we still have East and West Texas because, uh, you know, that could be the, the firewall here. Um, yeah. And as you pointed out, Cruz needed rural Texas. If you take a look at, you know, I think it's the census, you know, formally designates, you know, rural and non-rural counties. Um, you know, Cruz lost the non-rural counties, won the rural counties, which for Republican statewide dominance in Texas, the, 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 the you know, the uh, formula has always been, you know, you know, run up the score in those rural counties and then eke out, you know, a single yeah. win in those non-rural counties. And when I say non-rural, those are the suburban, urban and exurban counties. And that formula kind of uh, fell apart for Cruz. Um, and he had to rely on uh, the rural counties when you look at that breakdown. Uh, Abby, what do you think about that? Well, I have an anecdote from election night 2018, um, the first batch of votes came in and it looked like O'Rourke was going to win and it was going to be an absolute bloodbath in the congressional delegation. Like congressmen who I, Republicans, I didn't even dream were in trouble were down. I yeah. left my computer to go do a TV hit. And by the time I came back, it was much better for Republicans. It wasn't great, but Cruz was up and there was a little bit more equilibrium. And that to me was just the starkest illustration. And what it is, is the cities tend to count faster, but that dramatically kind of lays out like the divide, but also, you know, what to look for when results are coming in. If you're a junkie staring at the different yeah. vote counting websites. Right. <laughs> Speaking of 2018 comparisons, there is a, I think, at least in modern Texas political history, a pretty infamous moment on the 2018 election night at Cruz's party, election party in Houston, um, where, as Abby said, the, the suburbs and the cities reported very early and within that first hour of all the returns coming in, it looked like Cruz was in a, in a really bad position and his campaign right. manager had to take the stage at the election night party at this hotel in Houston and say, you know, basically say, everyone calm down. We're still waiting on all these rural counties to come in. Uh, because it was, you know, if you remember what it looks like in the, the opening hours of that night, it was looking pretty bad for Cruz. Um, and so, yeah, you have to obviously take right. into account that urban and. Well, I, I remember thinking, uh, Patrick, on on the night of 2018, on election night, uh, when when the early vote came in, and, and Beto O'Rourke was ahead of Ted Cruz on in Tarrant County, on uh, on the early vote, I thought this is not going to be a normal uh, election night, and in fact, it turned out to be. I mean, the the thing about the cities and the vote in the cities, Abby, there's been a, a disproportionate amount of interest in Harris County's early vote leading the state's counties. Uh, it's made Chris Hollins uh, uh, the, the most hated man in America in some circles, right? Because he's managed to do something. I mean, he's being attacked up through and including right before we got on this call today by Paul Bettencourt and others in Houston. Um, but the fact is that when you turn people out to vote, things happen. And the opportunity to vote made as widely available as Chris Hollins has orchestrated in Harris County, I mean, that really does illustrate the opportunity for the Democrats and the challenge for the Republicans is these fast growing communities like Houston and Harris County. Harris County's population is so large, it would be the 25th largest state in the country if it were a state. And if you turn out overwhelming numbers, you get to run up the score in the urban areas and potentially offset some of the vote in the rural areas, do you not? That's the, that's the challenge here. So if I, if I wasn't stuck in Washington with the pandemic, I would be planted in Harris County right now. Right, I think right, it's the right. most, although while I love Tarrant County, it's my home, uh, Harris is the single most fascinating place in American politics to me. And um, I, I started traveling there to cover these races that became competitive after 2016. And yeah. there's an energy and an interest. I mean, it's just interesting to me. But additionally, um, before I covered Texas politics, I covered all 50 states at roll call. And I've kind of come to think about it. This comparison doesn't quite work because Texas is so much bigger, but I've begun to think of Harris County as like the Chicago of Texas, where you said it, downstate Chicago is very red and Chicago, I mean, downstate Illinois, and Chicago is where they run up the score and maintain a democratic state. But what's amazing also with Harris County is its history. I mean, this is where George H.W. Bush came from. K. Bailey Hutchison and George W. Bush ran up huge margins in Harris County, and now it's just completely inverted. And so right. I, I just think that the, it is the single most fascinating place. And that was even before yeah. all of this turnout. Well, and in fact, it's just in a handful of cycles, right? 2012, which doesn't seem like that long ago, Barack Obama beat Mitt Romney in Harris County by a total of less than a thousand votes. And then two years, and then sort of Hillary Clinton then wins um, Harris County in 2016 by 160,000 votes. And then Beto O'Rourke beats Ted Cruz in Harris County, his home county, 
by more than 200,000 votes. So really Harris County is, has shifted significantly just in the last couple of cycles. Even in 2010, it was it, it felt the GOP wave as strongly as any other place in Texas. Yeah. Uh, pa Patrick, let me ask you uh, about uh, uh, the, the frame of this presidential election. Is Donald Trump running here or running elsewhere against Joe Biden or is he running against himself? Well, I think he'd like to think that he is running against Joe Biden, but, you know, both in Texas and nationally, I think his his problem has been that he has not run a campaign that has neutralized this from being a referendum on his own presidency. And that has obviously worked in Joe Biden's uh, favor. Uh, so my, uh, my my answer, regardless of what Trump thinks he's running against, uh, is that Trump is running against himself and that his presidential race, um, you know, he has allowed this presidential race to become a near total referendum on himself. And I think especially in these final uh, several yeah. years, his handling of the, the coronavirus pandemic. So I, I would say it is Trump running against himself in many ways. Yeah, Abby, that's that's the the, the truism of, of presidential elections is they're supposed to be about the next four years, but they're almost invariably about the last four years, right? I mean, yeah. And I think it's about the last eight months. Um, I mean, I in just- particular. This yeah. is just such a once in a generational transition. I mean, I'm not sure if I'm going to be home for Thanksgiving this year and I'm being advised not to be. And so I just yeah. think that when kids are not in school, it, this is such an upheaval. And I, I mean, it, voters are chewing on something they haven't done in a very long time on a scale. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, uh, Patrick, that uh, Kamala Harris was going to come to Texas on Friday. And indeed, that's the case. And we've uh, you know, heard rumblings about the possibility of a late Biden visit to Texas, although it seems like he's maybe saving his uh, nuts and going instead to Georgia and uh, possibly to Arizona, to Iowa, to places that did not seem to be on the competitive map previously. But let's just even just say Harris coming is something to Texas. And the ad buy that the Biden campaign has chosen to do late in this last week in Dallas, Fort Worth, in that area, which we understand is happening. That's a significant thing. Um, I, I'm curious to know what you're thinking about the Democrats' strategy in the next seven days is. So if you're the Democratic campaign manager, the Biden campaign manager, how do you think about these next seven days? What are you trying to accomplish? And what are the strategies and tactics that you employ? Within Texas specifically? Specifically. Right. Well, I don't think the public schedule has been released at least in full for Harris's visit. But I would if I were the Biden campaign, I would obviously want to send her uh, to Harris County, Tarrant County, Dallas County, any place where you have all these down ballot races that could use right. that energy boost. Although <laughs> Democratic enthusiasm, it's, it's kind of hard to think right now that it could be boosted even higher. Um, but if I were sending her anywhere in Texas, I would definitely want to send her to yeah. Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, you know, I mean, those are the three cities that come to mind immediately. Um, and the, you know, the, we may be talking about this more, but you know, Dallas and, and Fort Worth are all the same media market. And so you could send her to Fort Worth, which is a, a more uh, traditionally yeah. Republican area that Better Work narrowly won. And you can get the enthusiasm over there and also get the coverage extending over into Dallas because it's all one media market. So that would be a pretty savvy play, I think. Um, at the same time, the Dallas-Fort Worth area is the epicenter of the fight for the Texas House. Um, and we've seen down ballot right. candidates in Texas not afraid to embrace Biden. I mean, he has endorsed um, a number of congressional and state house candidates, and they've been very happy to have and promote his endorsement. And so um, that, yeah. that tells me that they would really welcome the opportunity to have him in their market. You know, Abby, the thing about Fort Worth, about Tarrant County, which is your home base, you know Fort Worth better than almost anybody I know, right, uh, politically. Except for Bud Kennedy. <laughs> well, I, I would actually take you against Bud Kennedy if that's the fight we're going <laughs> to have right here. But, but, but I digress. Um, uh, if you go back uh, to 1952, there's only been one presidential election cycle in which Democrats have won Tarrant County, and that was Lyndon Johnson in 1964. Obama lost Tar uh, Tarrant County twice. Clinton lost Tarrant County. Um, O'Rourke did win Tarrant County, who I think probably, I'm going to just say, and, you know, others on the call who are more veteran at this stuff than I am may be able to fact check this in real time. But I believe the last Senate candidate to win uh, Tarrant County on the Democratic side, probably Lloyd Benson. But O'Rourke won Tarrant County uh, by marginally last time. Um, Tarrant County has been for a very long time the most conservative large county in the country. And yet they're sending Kamala Harris several days before the election to Tarrant County. What does that tell you? And what are you hearing from your Fort Worth peeps? 
about that? Well, I think it means two things. One, uh, I had to do a correction on this. Apparently, the Dallas-Fort Worth market is the largest television market in the state, not Houston. So I think that's a big point of it. Um, yeah. And it's the bellwether. And um, I think, I mean, you can hit up. I mean, it's nice for me as a Fort Worth res, uh, having grown up in Fort Worth, to get a little bit of attention over Dallas. But um, I, I think it's the bellwether. I think you hit up the big market. But I also remember in fourth grade, Bill Clinton stopped at Meacham Airport in Fort Worth, and then he went down to the valley. And that's actually where I would have yeah. sent her because I think that could be the difference there. Well, in fact, the Castros, one or another of the Castros yesterday, I think it was Joaquin Castro, the congressman, was remarking that there would actually be a lot of value in the Biden campaign sending Harris or some high profile surrogate down to the Rio Grande Valley because the concern in the polls is that Biden is underperforming Hillary Clinton among Latino voters. Well, that, oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I would just jump in also. I don't know if the Biden campaign is thinking about the state legislature. I, I mean, I think they've got a lot of other things they're worried about. But I think there's also, I think, five state house candidates. Like, I think they call themselves the Tarrant Five. And so I think that it, it touches yeah. a couple of congressional districts in that too. So I don't know if it's strategic or not, but I think it's interesting. But Patrick, that was your point that if you go to Fort Worth, you end up this as the Jeff Leach race and the, I mean, pardon me, the, uh, the Bill Zedler race and the, uh, the the old Jonathan Jonathan Stickland seat, right? There are a whole bunch of races right. up there. Matt Krause's seat. There are the Collin County seats. There, I mean, there's and there's the two Dallas County seats. There's a the, the battle for the control of the House heading into redistricting is not immaterial. Whether the Biden campaign, to Abby's point, is paying attention to it or not, you do get more than one for the price of one. If you, and I, think, I think the I, I totally understand where Abby's coming from that, that the state house is probably not top of mind for them. But I thought it was notable when Jill Biden visited Texas. Um, oh, I think it was maybe two weeks ago. She did at the, the first day of early voting in each of her stops. She mentioned that we can bring this home. You know, it's, it's winning is possible in Texas for the first time in a long time. We can win this for Joe, but but also for the state house. She specifically shouted out um, the state house battle, which I thought was was interesting. Uh, yeah. Can I jump in on that? I, I mean, and I haven't talked to anyone high up in the Biden campaign, but there is a difference with this guy compared to Barack Obama. Obama was so new to politics. He drove Democrats crazy uh, down ballot. There were just so many slights that he, yeah. there were down ballot candidates. They would forget to endorse people. And Joe Biden is probably thinking in terms of a governing majority. And he, he and I, Barack Obama, I just was listening to him before the speech. I mean, the, this event, he was talking about state legislature. So there was a complete, un, like not paying attention to this last decade. And I think one, because they got social act in 2010, they're thinking about it now. But I also think Joe Biden is uniquely seasoned on that front. Uh, we uh, had news this morning, uh, first broken in the New York Times, confirmed by the Tribune and expanded upon that Michael Bloomberg, the former New York mayor who was such an unsuccessful presidential candidate, but has all the money, uh, has decided based on polls that he commissioned that Texas is winnable for Democrats. And so he is going to drop several million dollars, I mean, a bunch of money uh, into Texas here in the last seven days to run ads on Biden's behalf, beginning Wednesday, running through Election Day, specifically targeting the president's mismanagement of the coronavirus. Those are the words of his spokesperson. And they're going to run in English and Spanish. That is the strategy for Bloomberg in Texas. Patrick, how significant is this? I, th I think it is certainly significant. Um, you know, it's part of this trend of national democratic groups seeing a late opportunity in Texas, whether it's people involved in the presidential race or folks that are watching the U S yeah. Senate race, um, yeah. as with any late spending. Yeah. I think he's doing this through his, his, um, his super PAC, which is going to face uh, higher ad rates than, uh, you know, a normal candidate or campaign would. Uh, but in any case, we, we know from this whole cycle that Mike, right. Lee, when he spends money, he spends serious money and is, is going to spend it in a way that's, that he, right. they believe is going to be effective. So I think it is, right. is pretty significant. A Abby, Mike Bloomberg is less afraid of higher ad rates than he is of a 32 ounce big gulp, right? I mean, Michael, higher ad rates don't dissuade Mike Bloomberg. Yeah. So a number of my Republican sources have been anticipating this. Is Bloomberg going to come in? And yeah. I've been watching this guy since he, I guess, he really started getting going on this front in 2012. And right. um, yeah, 2012. And so what he does, a lot of campaigns like um, like to book their ads as early as possible. There's a Democratic super PAC, House Majority PAC. They like to book as early as possible to get the lowest rates. Michael yeah. Bloomberg does not care. 
he likes the element of surprise and he waits to the absolute last second and then springs it on the opposition so they can't, uh, yeah. they, they, they have to scramble. And I've seen him, it's lethally effective. And so many, I've seen it over and over. I don't know if it'll be effective here. It, 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 there is, uh, it, at the congressional level in Texas, there is precedent for this. I mean, he made a very late push last uh, election cycle across the country to wade into a number of competitive uh, U.S. House seats, including the seventh district and thirty. I was about to say, I thought Lizzie Fletcher also. Was right, right, exactly. He came in late in yep. both of those races with his yep. um, super PAC, and I'm sure you know helped uh, get them uh, over the finish line. On, on the question of response, late response, Abby, you know who's not coming to Texas is the Trump campaign, and, and specifically the president. I know that the chairman of the Texas Republican Party, Alan West, had actually said out loud at one point, very possibly to Patrick Svitek at the Tribune Festival, but I, I, I seem to remember recently, in any case, that he would love to see the president come back uh, to Texas at least one more time. In fact, he specifically cited, I thought, the DFW area. Come on back to North Texas. Help us out by making a trip. Rick Perry said the other day as a Trump surrogate that the president's not going to come back to Texas because Texas is not a battleground state. What do you think about that? Um, well, I'll tee one thing up for Patrick. We had a detail in a story um, two years ago about Trump coming in, and I think he probably remembers it better than I do, um, about Trump's influence in Houston. But I think there's several things going on. One, he when he's come to Houston, he's actually made some questionable remarks, or I don't know what the right word is, but he kind of teases Houston for getting so much Hurricane Harvey relief, like somehow they ripped off the federal government. And right. it, Houston doesn't about. have a sense of humor about that at all. No, Even not at all. Teases, right? yeah. um, and then also, if he comes to Texas, the, the, the campaign may be lost. I, I mean, th that is, you, you get to the 270 where it won't even matter if Texas is gone. Um, and then the third thing is, I mean, he's not spending on Texas. And I think that's probably, I mean, what I was expecting was Biden would drain Trump money. That's where Texas is relevant. But Trump hasn't really spent that much on Texas in comparison to what you would expect. And I yeah. think because he's out of money. So I, I think there are several things going on. Uh, Patrick, one or two more questions uh, before we go to the audience questions. We have some in the chat, and we're going to get to those here in a second. Um, Joe Biden has been criticized by Texas Republican leaders for comments he's made about fracking and for comments he's made about a transition away from oil. Here we again are on a call with the Baker Institute at Rice University in Houston, Texas, where the conversation around energy and oil is not immaterial. Is this a sufficient wedge for Republicans to use? Whether or not Biden's comments have been characterized accurately, and there's been some discussion of whether he was just clumsy in the way he said it, but in fact, his intent has been clear, not as what people think he said, or whether in fact he did say it. Is that a sufficient wedge? Uh, against him in Texas. Sure. And just to go back to what Abby said, I think what she's alluding to with that detail in that story is that after the U.S. Senate race in 2018, I think Ted Cruz's campaign more or less said, or it was reported that when they had Trump come to Houston and do a rally for Cruz. It was a net negative, right? Yeah. yeah. In that market. Um, yeah. So yeah, Trump coming, especially to one of these major markets is not always a, a net positive for, for Republicans. Um, on Biden and fracking, I, I don't know, you know how effective that issue is, but it's clear it's, it's one of the, you know, I think in Texas, one of right. the few lines that they have uh, against him. Um, you know, I think Biden's, uh, you know, predicament on this, if you want to put it that way, is he said some things, he has he has said some things in public about his position on fracking and oil and gas issues that have oversimplified or been inartful in, re in referring to his actual platform. Because his actual platform, you go to his, his you know, his website or, or see what, you know, what his uh, campaign officials or advisors, how they've described things is not, I would say, particularly radical, but he has been, you know, quoted in public sometimes inartfully or over, over uh, simplistically discussing um, his proposals. Um, I know yeah. that, you know, most recent, I think, example of this, and um, this obviously I think was, you know, blown up a little bit by Republicans, but at the debate on Thursday, you know, he said, yes, I want to transition away from the oil industry, um, which is not necessarily a, you know, controversial point, all things considered, um, but it was politically sensitive enough that yeah. the Democratic Congresswoman, freshman Democratic Congresswoman in Houston, Lizzie uh, Panel Fletcher, came out and said that he, you know, failed to, uh, you know, accurately, uh, you know, failed right. to accurately address the, the comprehensiveness of the situation in Texas. And we also saw some other, um, you know, some other vulnerable freshmen in uh, congressional seats come out and, and say the same thing, more or less, uh, yeah. in, in 
oil states. So, yeah. Um, Abby, uh, last question to you before we go to the audience here. Um, you uh, made an extremely sophisticated point, I thought, a couple of weeks ago in the Tribune, that while we normally see coattails that happen from the top down, there is an opportunity in this presidential race for there to be coattails in Texas from the bottom up, which is to say Biden may benefit from races further south on the ballot, turning people out that would ultimately uh, benefit him. C could you talk that uh, through a little bit? And what is your assessment of that a couple of weeks after you first said it, seven days out from election day? Well, the, the, the seed of it came from a conversation with Wendy Davis um, two years ago. And she was watching as an outsider of campaigns, um, she's now a candidate, um, Beto O'Rourke's campaign. And just like the rest of us, she was trying to make sense of it. And what she said was, besides the environment, there were so many different things going on in 2014 when she was running for governor. But she said, look, he's got 36 US House candidates on the ballot who are Democrats. She's like, I didn't have that. I didn't have any help. And so I think this like myth of having the one savior Democratic statewide candidate who can raise a lot of money and carry the party into the promised land was like way too much of a load for a single individual in a state as big as Texas. And so, you know, I was just watching O'Rourke and um, I, I kind of applied that in my analysis of the race last cycle. And then I actually, you know, I've been thinking about it this cycle and I actually talked to Congressman O'Rourke and he said, yes, that's it. Absolutely. I, I, he may have used an F word in there, too. No, but, probably um, so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. And so, um, you know, and so what I see happening is it's almost a destigmatization destigmatizing of the Democratic Party with all of these candidates showing up to the Rotary Club meeting and, you know, right. not being AOC, basically. Fascinating. Uh, uh, and, and, and I think we're, we're, we'll, we'll know again, as we, we end where we started, we'll know the day after Election Day whether the reverse coattails effect actually happens. So let's go to some questions. John Williams, I'm just going to say I think we have about 15 minutes before we turn it back over to you. So let's go through a, a, a series of those. Uh, uh, here is a question for you, Patrick. How is the run for Texas House Speaker shaping up? Any changes expected post-election day? Of course, that's not really on our topic today of the 2020 presidential race, but what the hell? Who doesn't love a good conversation about the Speaker's race? So uh, right. go, get, go get him. Yeah, well, up until the past few days, the race has publicly seemed kind of frozen with everyone waiting to see, um, you know, what the results of the election would be and whether the House itself would flip. And, you know, pre presumably that would set off the race more or less. Uh, but we did see some some recent moves on the Democratic side. Two candidates announced, Symphonia Thompson and then Trey Martinez Fisher. And so those have been very recent developments. But I think you probably still have a, a healthy um, you know, group of, of members, whether they're prospective candidates or prospective supporters of candidates who want to get through this, uh, you know, want to get through this November election, see who actually controls the House. I mean, you can't forget <laughs> on the Republican side, there, there are so many uh, that are being targeted um, that a lot of these guys are, are fighting for their political lives right now. And, and yeah. you know, figuring out who's going to lead the House next session is probably, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's probably one of the, the least things on their mind. I mean, you have right. Democrats, you know, targeting um, as many as, you know, 22 Republican held seats, um, open and incumbent seats. So again, some of these guys, uh, you know, are, are really in, in a fight for their political lives at the moment. It may not be the first thing on right. their mind. And also, you know, we uh, maybe alluded to this earlier, but given the potential for the results uh, in a lot of these down ballot races not to be um, you know, immediately known on election night, that could further kind of defer the speaker race. Again, if we don't know for weeks who's actually going to control um, the House, I, I guess yeah. not defer, but further cloud the speaker race if there's a little less certainty about who's yeah. going to control the House in, in January. I mean, right, right now, Patrick, the margin between Republicans and Democrats in the Texas House is 8367. We forget that just two years ago, if we were sitting here pre-election day 2018, it was 9555. It was nearly a Republican supermajority. Then all of a sudden, the Republicans lose 12 seats, and now it's within nine seats net of the Democrats taking back control. I can only imagine what two years ago us could have thought about us having a serious conversation two years later about the majority in the Texas House flipping because it didn't seem... A, a possible, but you could end up with a scenario, Patrick, where it's something in the vicinity of 76, 74 or 77, 73, where one party in control may need people in the other party to form a coalition of sorts to elect a speaker. Is that not more, more possible now? Oh, absolutely. I know in the past that that's been a little taboo internally, but uh, we're definitely, I think in that we're definitely going to end up in that territory where it's going to be necessary to have that 
um, you know, I think crossover support. Right. Um, and that's always been a sensitive issue, at least within the, the Republican Party in the House. Right. So as much as the P.T. Barnum part of me that John Williams alluded to would like to see Speaker Briscoe Cain in a 76, 74 House, that's probably not going to happen. Right. Pro probably not. Uh, <laughs> but there is no doubt. Democrats, <laughs> but on a serious note, I mean, if Democrats take the House, there's no doubt going to be a, a very fierce internal discussion in the Texas Republican Party about right. whether the path forward is more moderation, more compromise, or we didn't pay, paint in bold enough colors um, and that we need to do more to energize conservatives. So it, we laugh about that. And I don't think Chris McCain is going to be the next speaker, but that wing of the party may be leading one part of the conversation about where do we go from here. Yeah. Uh, Abby, so just as Patrick got an off-topic question, you have an off-topic question. Okay. Uh, Patrick's question was about the Texas House. Your question's about the U.S. House. How will the election potentially change the influence or seniority of the delegation? Maybe we should talk for a moment about the state of those races now, given the fact that the delegation is 23 de Republicans and 13 Democrats in the U.S. House. Um, uh, where Where is this likely to go from your vantage point today? Well, the delegation has been on a downward trajectory of clout over the last two terms because Repu there were a bunch of Republican chairmen and the Republican side of things, they have um, term limits on chairmanships. And so they've been phased out. And that's part of why we've seen so many retirements. Um, so, but I think we're going to have a very, very young delegation. And that means there's not going to be a lot of clout. But at the same time, I think it's some fresh new blood. Um, and no matter what happens, both sides have made a pretty concerted effort to uh, recruit diverse candidates. I think it's going to be less white. I think it's going to be less male. Um, and so I think it's going to be a really interesting delegation to watch. Um, I think it probably, um, I, I don't know, it's it's going to be, um, the, there's unlikely of a shot that Democrats will lose power. Um, so right now there will only be one chair, Eddie Bernice Johnson, over the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Um, but I think it's still a pretty young delegation, and and we shouldn't really expect anyone um, yeah. shooting up high. It'll it'll take a and, while. And the conventional wisdom, Abby, if you agree with this, say so. If you're comfortable that seven days out, that the four seats that Democrats are principally looking at, where they think they have a shot to win what have been Republican held seats are the San Antonio to El Paso seat that Patrick alluded to, Gina Ortiz Jones running for Will Hurd's old seat. The Pete, what was the Pete Olson seat in Fort Bend County that Shree Kulkarni running against Sheriff Troy Nels. Yeah. The old Kenny Marchant seat, uh, suburban Dallas that is the mayor of Irving, Beth Van Dyne, the Republican running against educator Candace Valenzuela. And then the Chip Roy, Wendy Davis marquee battle Austin snaking through the hill country down to San Antonio. Those have conventionally wisdom, conventional wisdom has been that those are the four seats that so they're looking I, at principally. Yes, and I put those seats into two different buckets and I think you yeah. can look at the larger landscape. Um, and the Texas third of Collin County is also shooting up in interest in, on both sides. But yeah. I think you have to think of a district like Shri Kulkarni, Troy Nell's Sugarland um, as suburban. And that's probably more gettable for Democrats. Whereas yep. the, the 23rd um, and the 21st are city, suburban, and then there's a huge chunk of rural in both of those. And I think those are going to be very polarized right. and more difficult for Democrats to get. Yeah, you know, I remember when James Carville, again, John Williams is old enough like me to remember this. James Carville famously, once upon a time, referred to Pennsylvania politically as Pittsburgh and Philadelphia separated by oh, Alabama. <laughs> That, that Wendy Davis district is kind of like Austin and San Antonio separated by Alabama, is it not? That part of the hill country that snakes down through those two cities is super conservative compared to those big urban areas. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a harder lift, but it'll be interesting to see. I mean, it is just a matter of can the cities overwhelm the rural? And it's the statewide story as well. The, yeah. the, Patrick. The, just the... the for just a little more context, the San Antonio part of that congressional district is actually pretty battle groundy. You do have that like hill country conservative anchor, and then you have very blue up in the Austin part. But the San Antonio part of it is actually uh, pretty competitive. Right. You just kind of re remember the previous occupant of that seat was Lamar Smith from San Antonio, and it was reliably a Republican seat to the point that for many years that Lamar Smith was running for reelection, the Democrats didn't even field a candidate. Right. It was not a winnable district for them. That was a waste of time. So a couple of uh, questions about the never Trumpers, Patrick and Abby. Um, I would say that in the great Venn diagram of the never Trumpers, the Lincoln Project is a mere circle inside the larger circle. But of course, they've tended to suck a lot of the conversation air 
uh, uh, in. Um, have they had any impact? And will they be blamed or vindicated by Republicans if Trump loses? Abby, go first. <laughs> I think that in Texas, in the political class, there are more never Trumpers than one would think. I think there are some folks who are quiet about it um, and they do not want Donald Trump to win. Um, that said, I think with the folks in, like in the Lincoln Project who've made that decision to actively work against Trump, and it's not just Trump, it's down ballot candidates. Um, I think those bridges are burned and I think it is good. I, I really enjoy listening to the bulwark, which is Charlie Sykes. There are several podcasts. Tim, I listen Tim to. Miller. Right. Yeah. And I yeah. think that this is a bridge burning exercise. And I, I do not know how this party comes back together, but weirder things right. happen. You know, Patrick, I don't really see an all is forgiven moment in the direction of Rick Wilson when this election ends, regardless of the outcome. Sure. Yeah. And there's no doubt that there's anti-Trump Republicans out there, but I'm, I'm always interested in terms of gauging that because, you know, obviously you can't necessarily pick that up in a poll every single time is, you know, how much is that reflected in these down ballot candidates in swing districts? Are they seeking distance from the president? Um, and I know there were some recent headlines about John Cornyn, um, you know, allegedly trying to do this. But if you look down ballot, these congressional candidates, these state house candidates, there again, some of them may not be, you know, bear hugging Trump, but we have no one anymore like a Will Hurd who I think, yeah. you know, would overtly right. agree with the president on some issues. Um, the, you know, the the Republican who's running to replace Will Hurd in his district, uh, in his primary runoff, very actively sought and touted the endorsement of Donald Trump and is now having to pay right. for in the general election. Um, so again, I'm just curious always how much is that. Um, that anti-Trump Republican angst reflected in the candidates. And I don't see a lot of down ballot candidates right now in Texas who are um, trying to separate themselves from the president. Again, they may not be in, at this point in the election in the fall, you know, hugely embracing the president, uh, but no one I see is, is really making an effort to run away from him. I think just because my generation is starting to run for office, I think if you're a never Trumper, you just don't run. Yeah, you just decide to opt out, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, let me uh, take one, uh, at least one more question here, and it's more uh, uh, narrowly focused on the state. A and that is, what do you both think of the decision by the governor, which has now been after some back and forth in the courts, bolstered ultimately by the final authority uh, uh, to limit the number of drop boxes for, for uh, mail ballots in um, counties all over the state of Texas, so that Loving County, which has like one person living there, and Harris County, which has 4.6 million people, each have one Dropbox. And what do you think about overall efforts that some characterize as voter suppression? How will that impact this election cycle? Patrick, you first and then Abby. Right. Yeah. And there's no doubt that these, you know, these moves that we're broadly referring to, you know, objectively, uh, you know, make it harder to vote. Um, I think from a political perspective, Abbott has felt um, a lot of pressure from his right uh, over the past few months to crack down on this. The uh, You mentioned Chris Hollins earlier. The new state Republican Party chairman, uh, Alan West, has been probably one of the most vocal Republican critics of Chris Hollins and his right. plans for his voting plans in Harris County. Um, the Abbott decision to limit those mail-in ballot drop-off boxes boxes that you just mentioned came, you know, within a span of days after Alan West joined a lawsuit against Abbott for his extension of the early voting period. So I think politically Abbott is is feeling uh, probably some of the most heat from his right that he's felt in his in his governorship um, over these decisions made on voting, but also more broadly over just how he has aggressively wielded executive authority um, during the pandemic, whether it's on voting issues or other issues like the, the statewide mask mandate. And so yeah. Politically, I think that he is, is is feeling that heat. And again, you have people like Alan West leading the charge more aggressively than Abbott. I think on his right, he, he senses that. Uh, Abby, you know, the conversation nationally has been about these efforts, not just in Texas, but elsewhere. We're just part of the national conversation on this subject. Absolutely. And I think that's kind of one of the interesting parts of my position being in Washington. And I see things from afar. It's on the news every time I turn it on. Um, I mean, even yesterday, I turned on Julie Mason's radio show and Sylvia Garcia, Congresswoman of Houston, was talking yeah. about it. And so I just wonder, is this did it almost backfire and that it drew more attention on how to vote that it if it was on the news all the time and there was so much discussion, did it kind of have the reverse effect and make people all right. the more motivated? Is, is, is the reason that we're seeing the precipitous turnout in the early vote because people had it drummed into their heads that there was some risk 
right? To, to their ability to cast their ballot. I think people would have come out anyway. I just think that's the nature of this election. But I also yeah. just think it, it didn't do anything to tamp down voter turnout, it looks like. That's true. Uh, John Williams, I think we're at five till. And I think that according to our run of show, that means I need to turn it back over to you. Let me say that as the uh, CEO of the Tribune for these 11 years, and um, as somebody who cares enormously about politics, uh, there is no better partner than the Baker Institute. Thank you for having us. And I will tell you that uh, two of the greatest people I've ever had the opportunity to work with in all the years I've been doing this are Patrick Svitek and Abby Livingston. And so what a pleasure it is to get to talk to them. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Abby, Patrick, Evan, thank you so much for providing what once again is a brilliant brand of discussion, smart and intelligent that we've come to expect for so long from the Texas Tribune. It was very good. And I hope and expect that we can do it again. Great. Before we leave, I just want to encourage everybody to please get out and vote. It's important to democracy. It's also a very good way to express yourself. Best of luck and thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you.